So we're like, we're like all a bunch of people who love to experiment, right? And that's part of our job, to gain new insights. And one of my favorite new experiments is experiment, experiment with mice. Hopefully, well, most of the mice like this. Uh, but there is a uh, really quite famous experiment. Uh, I mean, as scientists, people love to experiment with mice because they share some biological similarities with us humans, apparently. And so the experiment goes, I think you've heard it before, uh, there's a mouse, there's a maze, there's cheese. Okay? And so the researchers ring a bell when they put the cheese over here. And the mouse runs through the maze and gets the cheese. And they repeat this experiment like weeks on end. Ring the bell, the mouse runs through the maze, gets the cheese. So after a couple of months, they open a side door in the maze. So all the mouse really has to do is walk out back, side door, and the cheese is right there. So what happens when they ring the bell? What happens? It goes through the maze. Habit, right? Any of you recognize that you do this in your work? So here's, here's the problem that I'm seeing, that we all say that we care about the whole complete user experience, everything, the whole enchilada. But what I'm really seeing is that when people come to us with problems, and I'm one of these guys, I'm like, yeah, uh, we really don't, because we jump into solutions, we jump into wireframing, oh, I can do this, so I can do a custom journey map. What you're, not, what you're really doing there is you're not solving a problem. That's a means to an end, but you really need to know what the end is before you go and do that. So what you're doing is people are coming to you with problems and you're answering like this. Let me sketch some wiring for you. Let's do a design studio. Or even, I hear you as a design studio, you need an app. Because everybody's a mobile app. And you have a solution straight away without looking at it. So I'm saying, <laughs> say hello to another friend. And he's telling you, and me to be much better at asking questions. And I know that Kelly Gola was talking yesterday about why finding uh, John Colco today, we were looking at all this. And see, the questions we're asking, that's the important stuff. The same one when I was at Jonathan James uh, McAnuka's workshop yesterday. I'm seeing the same thing. This is what we need to be doing, but we're not doing it as much as we should. Right? The graphical user face interface is not always the right answer. I'm going to share some stories with you today. Uh, a while back, I was working, was back in the day, it's like 13 years ago, uh, I was working uh, as a consultant for Ericsson. Back in the time they actually recruited people, I was working with human resources. And they needed a new system to handle all the CVs and applications that were coming into the company and sharing them amongst the different recruiters, sharing them across uh, departments, sharing them across countries. It's a huge project, actually. Uh, the, like, but yeah, we had like, these beauty contests, the different suppliers. I think all of the systems are bought out by Monster today, but anyway. Uh, so we had 20 people working full-time, sort of three months, and costing a lot of money. And this was a while ago, so I was sort of like a junior designer, but it all comes down to my user test again. That was what was going to decide if the project was, a, project was a success or not. And what happened was, we did, uh, did the testing, I had the tasks for the recruiters, and uh, they said no. It was way too slow. It was impossible to work with. Uh, and I think this is something we ignore sometimes, that thinking about speed and uh, yeah, basically you know, how fast people can complete the tasks on the technology side, speed in that sense. But the important thing really to remember, to remember here is that uh, we managed to complete the project, the project anyway, because we built the whole system in two weeks after that, after it was a failure. We actually didn't pay the supplier because we had to leave the contract like people do. They went out of business. Uh, we built it in two weeks. So 30 people, two months, couldn't build what we built in two weeks, two people. Now the thing was, of course, that we'd spent all that time 
learning about the users, the recruiters. We were spending time with them. We were understanding the real problems. And we saw that they were using Outlook every day. And we were starting to think, well, can we solve this with Outlook? And we could. We had, we had shared, fol shared folders. We could use web forms that actually were formatted so it was easy to search and easy to sort among the CDs. But huge success. They used that system for three years. So when you know more, don't be afraid to actually change direction. Do something different. And I hated this when people say that, we've well, invested so much time and money in all this, uh, but we can't really go back. Go back. Go back. Do it over if you know more, if you have more insights. So it was never about the design of the interface, actually. It was just about understanding how people work. And also, this is a really good point about the story as well, that we want to design all these new cool systems, and we forget about the ones that we're already working with. Well, everybody's saying, yeah, everybody has mobile today, everybody has Outlook too. And even though you may hate Outlook, they're working in it every day. Isn't that really useful? You don't have to change the system, you can stay in the system that you're already in. Think about that for a while. Another story is, I worked with the energy company Vattenfall, which is huge in Europe. And I was asked to design this form for moving house. So we're moving from one house to another through a changing electricity supply. And what Vattenfall said they needed was, they needed the personal identification number of you. They needed that, what's it called, 12-figure facility ID for your electricity facility. But they also needed that for the person moving to your apartment and preferably also to the person whose apartment you were moving into. It was really impossible to get that information for the user. And I said, we're not going to do that. It's better for them just to call them, which they ended up doing. So I actually said no to that project because I knew it was going to be a failure. You can't solve the problem with design if the real user problem persists, if it's still there, right? When I started my company three years ago, I wanted to, I wanted a bank, of course. So I went online to SCB and I filled in this form. Simple form. Could have designed it better. Uh, but what happened was, it took two, pe two, uh, two weeks for people to respond. Two weeks before they actually called me after I filled in that form. And by that time, of course, I already was set up with another bank. So the problem was not design. Unless you define design as problem solving, which I know a lot of people are starting to do. They're not returning my messages because there's some, some other problem. Somebody could ask me to design that form much better, to optimize it, which would be a fun project. But if nobody's responding to the form, why do it? You need to find the real, real core of the problem. So what you should have been doing, of course, is when somebody comes to me with that type of problem, start asking why who, what, when, why? Mm -hmm. All those easy, simple questions that we should be asking all the time when we're designing. Start there. Don't start with the wireframes. Don't start with the sketching. Start with actually talking to people, understanding their pain points. That's how you get any insights. So, another project that I'm working on right now uh, it's, it's one of the largest member websites in Sweden. It's health services, national health services, where you actually, you book time with your doctor and you renew your medical recipes and stuff like that. So, uh, we totally redesigned this, uh, sort of a huge success. We launched in December, everybody was really happy. Of course, there were some who weren't as happy as us. And my client was really happy. But the thing is, is that one example is, there was a department, a psychology department, that was responsible for answering questions uh, from users in the system. Requests doubled overnight because it was now much easier and more apparent that you could do this. But they weren't ready for that. So they hated it. So now we have to think about, was, was that really a success, success or not? Beautiful interface. Every, everybody could use it much better. Everybody loved it. But if people are getting worse experience because they're not getting a response from a department 
but can't handle all the, all the requests, then it's sort of a failure, isn't it? So I'm treating it as a failure. And actually, now starting to work more with the people behind the system, the people operating the system, and what their needs are. So, what I'm trying to say here is when we all start talking about design, we're sort of shooting ourselves in the foot. Uh, because then what happens is we all have to start defending design decisions. We start defending interfaces. And that's not what we want to be doing. We want to be talking about what problems we're solving. So this is my takeaway from what I've learned through, through these projects. Solve the real problem. Shift the questions and open your mind to change. Focus less on the sign and more on the actual operational problems, what you're trying to accomplish. And it's not just about the users, it's also about the operators, the people who are on the other side of the users. How, how often do you actually take those people into account? And be, you, you should be able to bear, I know that's a strange word, I just needed it to make, make solve work here. To bear means change direction. But when you know more, change direction. Seriously. Don't be afraid to scrap something that you've done before. <laughs> this is all coming down really to what we know, now know more about when we're working with Lean UX. Enable existing tools. This is one I think most of us are forgetting. What tools are people using already that can do the stuff that we want them to be able to do? They just haven't been educated in the tool. Maybe we just need to teach people how to use the tool they already have. Right? So when somebody asks you, uh, so you do wireframes, right? You're like, no, dude. I do the whole enchilada. And by the way, what's your problem? I bet I can solve that for you. And that's my talk. Thank you. So I'm from Sweden, I do a podcast, you've probably seen me and James around here, and uh, got my card on your way out, and I'm here for questions as well. First of all, great talk. Thank you very much. Um, how do you convince your clients that it's worth the time? Because very often I find myself in a situation when my clients want me to give them the uh, deliverables and uh, when I want to do some research or even just talk to their clients, uh, there's no time for that. That's been my question in every workshop so far, actually. How do I convince the clients yeah. that this is a good idea? And my conclusion has been that you do it anyway. And you do it in small increments. You start by doing it, you do like guerrilla research and you show some results. And when you show the results, that's when they start gaining insights. Oh yeah, maybe that is a good idea. Can you, can you do that again with those people over there? And so just do it in a tiny amount uh, when you have some time over. I think that's the best way. If you really believe in it and you think it can change the way you work, then spend time doing it even in your free time. Go and talk to some people. Show them some trial. Yeah, and then video. Video is always excellent for convincing people. Okay. People have, having trouble with interfaces, 
and there's nothing better. I love that example, yeah. And I, some, uh, an example I sometimes use as well is uh, TripIt. Uh, I email my itinerary to TripIt, it brings everything up, and it, uh, and it also texts me about my trip. I have TripIt Pro, so it's perfect for me. It texts me, so it texts me, I don't have to be online even to get answers about if my flight is delayed and stuff like that. So we forget about texting sometimes, don't we? Texting is really cool. <laughs> it works. So there's lots of examples where people actually take away the interface and Really, it's not about building a web form for inputting your data, it's about using the data that's already there in those cases. I like that. Somebody in here has a question. I have a for you. Yeah, excellent. Uh, sometimes you just can't stop the project. It just happens. Yeah. Don't you think that a good design can create the willingness of people to learn with the A good design is? Oh, sorry, yeah, absolutely. I totally agree. I'm not really, I mean, that, this is a provocative title that I had for my talk, and I was, I, I A&B tested it on Twitter, because I, that's, I wanted people to come, so. <laughs> but, but it's, it's not, but it's more about, stop talking so much about design, and start talking more about solving problems. Because when we use the word design, people have ideas of what that means. And design doesn't always have to be what, what the looks are, and that's what most people who are outside of this room think when they hear the word design. So it's, I, I truly believe in beautiful interfaces, absolutely. Uh, have you ever uh, worked with users that don't speak the same language as you do? Sorry, have I ever worked with? With users that don't speak the same language as you do. Um, I have, I have. With the back part, I did usability studies in Germany. But I was sitting uh, with one of those one-way mirrors. And I don't, I don't like this methodology, but I was, <laughs> and I was, I had headphones on with a translator translating for me what they were saying.